I won't belabor too long, but we'll turn the time over to Dr. Carden. <laughs> Yay, yeah. compost, compost, compost. I don't know why actually we in, named it that, but you, you can say this. I thought I'd maybe get a little animation and put some punctuation at the end of it there. Some people, that's compost, compost, compost. And for some people, it's compost. <laughs> Others, it's a question mark. My wife would have a sad face at the end of it over there. In fact, she asked me the other day, she says, if you die before I do, do I have to keep composting? <laughs> I said, no, you can, you can be done with that, you know. Anyway, it's, it's kind of funny. It, it, it does have that kind of feel for some people. For some, like myself, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, satisfying in the sense that you're uh, taking advantage of a very, I think, one of the more underutilized resources that we have available to us. Uh, in home gardening and elsewhere, for that matter. And, uh, you know, if it's done right, it's actually a very pleasurable, not just satisfying, but I love the idea of getting into what these really earthy materials become. And to me, compost doesn't smell if it's done right. We'll talk about that later on. It's one of the more uh, enriching, I think, aromas that there are in life, that earthy smell and, and things like that. I only bring that up because there's an interesting article that my cousin just sent me not too long ago that notes the fact that there are certain bacteria that live in the soils that give off particular uh, aromas, even their bodies themselves when they come in contact with our nasal membranes and other things, that elicit responses in us. It actually contributes to our sense of well-being. Um, which, if you ever wondered why you feel better when you've been outside in the outdoors, apparently that's one of the reasons, that there are natural bacteria, and named to several species, that we, can, we inhale uh, byproducts, we inhale their uh, uh, particulate as well, and uh, it helps us feel better for some reason. So you're getting high, literally, on soil, okay? <laughs> but... Uh, we, we, we'll look at it from a bunch of different aspects. Hopefully, by the time we get done, you'll have a chance, because this is a real art. There's, there's some science behind it, but there's a lot of art in, in doing compost the, the right way. And uh, how many of you actually have experimented with playing with compost? Okay, quite a few of you, most of you. Um, and there's all kinds of different ways, but we'll talk about maybe things that will help optimize it for you as you go along. And again, obviously, everybody's going to be apologizing for slides. I printed out a handout of all of these slides so that you could have it, and their urgency sensor on the copier apparently went off, and it, and it failed. <laughs> so in between this talk and the one I give again on the same topic at 2 o'clock, I'm running back up to campus. Hopefully by then the parade will be over and I can get through up there. Um, but we'll get up there and get the handouts and bring them back. You can get a copy of it later on. So realize that all of these slides I'll have up here you'll have access to uh, in a handout later on and you can follow along and maybe make some sidebar notes as you see things that pique your uh, curiosity interest or you have questions about and things like that. So let's talk about the process. What are we trying to do with composting? Well we've got this pile of stuff, right? <laughs> a lot of waste material from whatever it might be, just leaf shed from deciduous plants, clippings from your lawn, uh, spent uh, plant materials from the garden, uh, house plants, whatever it might be that you have that are organic materials that can be conveniently broken down and utilized as a resource in our soil and providing organic matter and other things we'll talk about later on. But the pile is interesting because the only way for it to eventually process is for it to be munched on by little critters. Bacteria, fungi, uh, the larger insects as they begin to break this material down. They're the ones that are going to do the refining of that raw material into something that we call compost. And so we want to feed them properly and give them good habitat for them to function and perform the way that they ought to. And so we provide them food, okay? I'd like to eat it in and out all the time, but that's a little bit too much protein, you know, in my diet. I'd be fairly imbalanced if I don't mix in some fiber and I don't mix in some water and some other things along the way, okay? We all have our favorite foods, 
but to excess, they wouldn't really give us the nutrition that we want. So I've got to give them a mix of different things. So we give them in equal parts, essentially, green materials that are high in nitrogen, which is one of the major nutrients that they're going to need to perform this decomposition process, and brown materials that are higher in carbon, which are also an important building block of their bodies and the things that they're trying to, um, to utilize in order to, to function the way that they ought to. So nitrogen, which is involved in proteins and enzymes and other things, and carbon, which is the building blocks of the cell and those kinds of things equally needed by the microbes that are going to be doing the work. And we want to make sure that there's plenty of water and things for them to function like they should. <clears throat> What's going to happen is that that material is literally going to burn. It's going to oxidize over time, but in a controlled setting, not like lighting a match and it really going like crazy. But it's doing that very same chemical reaction, but a more managed, uh, controlled way. And so it generates a lot of heat. You've all been out there and felt your compost pile, right? When it's cooking like it should, on its own, it's generating a lot of heat. In fact, those piles can get up to about 140, 145 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the size of the pile and how much heat actually builds up inside. But that's a really important part of the function of these compost piles as we, as we, uh, as we construct them and manage them properly. And some water vapor will go off and things like that. Carbon dioxide goes off. We lose carbon material over time. And that's why the total mass begins to kind of reduce, okay? And so we're reducing volume in the process of composting because a lot of the carbon that's in that material gets utilized and it's respired off into the atmosphere by the microbes that are doing the work in there, okay? We eventually end up with a finished product where it's taken all of those nutrients, all of those materials, the raw materials, and broken them down into a product that when I introduce it into the soil, it's ready to start doing some very important things for me. It's going to start contributing to the binding of mineral material in the soil into aggregates. It's going to provide additional food for microbes in the soil to continue the process of breaking it down so that they maintain healthy function as well, which contributes to the overall quality of the soil. There's all kinds of other things that are, it's going to provide. It's going to provide surface area for the retention of water in the soils to help build water holding capacity. It's going to provide nutrient back to the soil and the plants, the microbes and everything else that's there as it breaks down the rest of the way and releases its nutrients back into the system. Uh, yes, most of them. You'll find some nitrogen, some phosphorus, some potassium, the big three that are needed. Um, yeah, in smaller quantities, depending on the kinds of plant materials, okay? The big ones that we're uh, going to be getting a lot from in most of our compost materials are nitrogen and some phosphorus, okay? Depending on the product, too, that you might incorporate in it and, and use it <clears throat> along the way. But some of those other minor nutrients are all contained in the cells of the plants and animals that are breaking down and contributing to that final product, okay? So they're all there in various quantities. All right. We want to make sure that we've broken it down far enough that when we introduce that finished material, it's not so high in carbon content anymore compared to the nitrogen content in it that it's going to cause an immobilization of nutrients. How many of you have ever heard of nutrient immobilization in soils before, hand or two. What am I talking about when it happens there? If the material is too high in carbon content versus the nitrogen content that's in it, it's going to continue to break down if I introduce it into the soil, right? So we've got microbes that are going to be begin to attack it now when I introduce it into the soil. And those microbes are going to need nitrogen primarily. It's the one that they are most efficient in most of the time, our soils uh, in terms of providing uh, biological life with the nutrients they need. Nitrogen's generally our most limiting nutrient. So they're going to start taking the, the available nitrogen from the soil pool away very quickly. They're very quick to respond. Uh, those microbes, they're very uh, advantageous and, and efficient in beginning to take up what's there to uh, increase in numbers to attack what you've just put into the system. So they're going to arrest that nitrogen 
for a time in their own bodies while they're doing the continued breakdown of the material. So if there's not enough nitrogen in the material that we introduce to help provide that nutrition, the microbes are going to take it from the soil around. And so literally, you can put in a compost, what you think is a, is, a, is a nice compost that's dark and it looks good and things like that, you put it in and you'll notice a depression in the nitrogen nutrition of the plants around where you've introduced it because the microbes have started pulling it away from the soil into their own bodies to continue to do the breakdown of that organic material and it's not going to be available for the plants that are right there immediately. So we want to prevent that from happening. We want to prevent that immobilization. If there's enough in the material to, con to provide for continued breakdown, then it won't take the available nitrogen away from the soil and you'll have a happy, balanced system. The microbes will continue to work on the material. The plants will still have nitrogen available to them. And then as it breaks down further, that'll be re-released. Even more will be released back into the system. There's a question over here. Is that what happens when I put my horse manure and sawdust mixture in the soil? Yes, yeah, because it's probably too high in carbon content. We'll look at some of the differences in the materials here and what is a woody material or what is a brown material versus a green and and, uh, and and what we're shooting for in terms of ratios, yeah, in there. A lot of my compost comes out in clumps. What is that? <laughs> uh, if it's too wet, a lot of times it'll clump up and begin to mat up. Not enough brown materials will contribute to that too. It's just like your own uh, flies have begun to find me. The uh, the amount of fiber that we introduce into our own diet helps with that digestion and breakdown. And so we have that balance. We want to make sure we have a balance in green and brown materials and the right amount of water content in it. And what is the balance? We'll get into that in just a minute as we go along. Yeah. So here are lists, and it's not a comprehensive list, it's just an idea list here of what we consider to be, and I can't see it over here, brown materials and green materials. And then we'll talk about the recipe here too in a minute. So brown materials, if we have taken grass and it's been set aside and it's begun to dry and, and, and uh, brown up and things like that, then we've lost a lot of that nitrogen that's in that material and it tends to be a little higher in carbon content. On the other hand, fresh grass clippings are very high in nitrogen content versus carbon. Okay, so grass clippings can fall in either one of these categories depending on its age when it's introduced into the pile. Okay. So things that tend to be drier or woodier are in our brown materials category. Woody materials like chips and sawdust, bark uh, chips, stalks, say from the corn stalks, for instance. Corn stalks are quite a bit higher in carbon content than the leaves are. And so even though there's nitrogen in the corn stalk, it's a lot more woody. And so it might be something we want to put in kind of our brown category in our minds when we're making these mixes. Stems of uh, various uh, woody plants and, and uh, even of your um, garden plants, you've all gotten at the end of the season those really nice tree trunks from your cabbage <laughs> or your broccoli. Those are pretty woody materials for an herbaceous plant and uh, they're pretty high in carbon content compared to nitrogen. Okay. Paper products. Now, I don't want you going out and I, want, I don't want you to put uh, treated paper and coated paper necessarily into your compost. Those things like your laser printer paper and copier paper, some of those kinds of things have actually been treated with things that help prevent their breakdown over time. And I, I don't want that in my compost pile. But things like newsprint and, and uh, cardboard ca carton uh, materials, they're fantastic. The only thing I would be uh, cautious of in those is if you see really bright fluorescent colors uh, printed on the sides of the box or, or the newspaper, not the colored inks that we see, but the real bright fluorescent colors, they have metals in them that provide that vibrancy and we don't want those in the system. But almost all of the newsprint now, uh, newspapers and things, 95 plus percent of the ink, even the colored inks that are used are plant-based inks. Uh, in cartoning, particularly corrugated uh, cartons, uh, the adhesives now are mostly plant starch-based adhesives and as well as the inks being plant-based inks. So uh, you can typically compost those, but those are very high carbon content. Now there's a hand here or two that we'll stop and do. Okay. Tear, tear them up and... Yeah. 
in all of these things, I want to try to increase the surface area as much as I possibly can for attack. So I'm not going to throw a big sheet of newspaper in. I'm going to try to break it up, okay? Otherwise, it's going to mat as it goes along number one. And number two, it just doesn't have as many points of attack as it might otherwise if I break it up in smaller pieces. So for like newsprint, if I use that, um, I'll throw in some of that because well, I need a lot of brown material sometimes to counteract the fact that I got way too many grass clippings, for instance, this particular week. So I'll take my newsprint out, I'll throw it in a bucket, and I'll soak it for a few hours. And then I've got this little like whisk thing that I made up that I can attach to my drill. <laughs> and I stick it in the bucket and I just fire that hand drill for just a little by, and it makes this slurry, soupy, paper pulpy stuff that I can mix directly into the compost then as a brown material. And it, you know, it, it mixes in well with the grass clippings or other things that are there, and it's a really good brown material addition when I need a little extra. Yeah. You can shred it. Yeah, the shreddings work as well. I like the slurry because I need to add water anyway typically, so I'm kind of killing two birds that way, but that's just my own preference. Okay. So shredding it's really good, but make sure you kind of grind it up a little bit. With some of these other things, stuff that comes out of the garden, my waste vine and uh, you know the stuff from the trees, for the most part, if it's not too thick, um, I windrow it up on my, uh, my grass, and I've got an old lawnmower that's got a bag on the back. I just run over it with the old lawnmower, and it busts it up pretty good. The vine, you know, like tomato vine and potato vine and you know, all those things out of my garden, I just run over them with an old lawnmower really choose them up good and toss those into the compost. Okay. Corn stalks as well. I let them dry down a little bit, I'll chop them up in you know, three or four foot lengths, and I'll just run them over with the, that old lawnmower. And you can throw those through a chipper. They'll process through a, a household chipper like a, a tree chipper pretty well too. Corn, corn stalks will. Pine needles, pine cones, what about uh, Pine needles and uh, pine cones are a little bit better because they're more woody, okay? The pine needles themselves, have very thick wax uh, lignin cutin kinds of uh, coatings on the on the leaf which break down really 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 slowly you can put them in a compost and they'll provide kind of a uh, an aeration factor in there because they break down so slowly they're very high carbon materials but they won't break down as fast as the cones will if you break break those up yeah the only problem is is that around here why don't we save that pH question for later? Because that's, <laughs> that's a really interesting one. Well, but yeah, it'll, it'll lower a little bit the pH of the material. But that really, when you introduce it in the soil, won't change much in terms of the pH of the soil. Yeah. And I had a question about using um, pine needles to use windmills. And this might be a pH question also. My mother-in-law wanted me to ask you, if you mix the pine needles with the soil where you plant potatoes, does that stop them from getting scab? Or uh, typically not, because we'll talk about that in a little while. Because of all the, the buffering capacity we have in our soils, we have loads and loads and loads of calcium carbonate in our soil, all of that would have to be dissolved first before I can begin to lower pH. So there's so much there that when it does break down and it releases a little bit of, of acid, it's consumed really quickly and neutralized. And so we'll get into the the problem of scale that we deal with in our soils here in the western U.S. because of that, particularly in Utah, as we get to the end, if we got time, remind me that we're going to talk about pH as we go along. Okay, so those are kind of the woodier materials, higher carbon content materials. The green materials, things like grass clippings, those are the fresh ones, kitchen residuals, and plant-based kitchen residuals, not the meat and uh, fatty things. You can put those in your compost pile if you like. They will decompose but they'll bring critters and pathogens and smells that you don't want to deal with, okay? <laughs> Neither do your neighbors. And they make your wife very unhappy, that sad face at the back end of compost, compost. <laughs> so don't put anything that has animal fats in it at all in your compost because it'll just tend to make things smelly. And around here, it'll attract rodents and snakes and bats to your compost and... Uh, we don't want to deal with them most of the time, and they too will have pathogens that we don't want to deal with, particularly the rodents and bats. So um, most manures, and this would be uh, 
not carnivorous <laughs> animal manures, okay? So the dog and cat scat, things like that, we don't want it in that because of that animal fat processing that goes on in their gut. So we want, uh, you know, the plant eaters manure type uh, products if we can get them and we want to deal with them. Fruit and vegetable waste, cull vegetables and things. Coffee grounds, how many of you ever discovered coffee grounds as part of you, okay? I don't drink coffee, but I love the way it smells. So it has two purposes. It's really good high nitrogen material that you can put in the system and you get some aromatherapy associated with it. But, <laughs> but uh, well, uh, weeds, that's okay, that's a good point. You can use weeds. I would use weeds only if, number one, it's not vegetatively propagated, which means things like crabgrass, uh, morning glory, or we call it, it's bindweed. Uh, those kinds of things that can sprout and grow on their own from a cutting, we don't want those in the compost because they'll begin to proliferate. All of a sudden you've introduced them into this wonderful growing medium and they take off. We don't want that. And before they go to seed, because I don't want to deal with trying to kill the seed. So if you can catch annual weeds, you know, uh, even perennial weeds for that matter, the, the, the above ground portions, if they don't go to seed and they're not vegetatively propagated, then they're okay to introduce into the, they're just plant materials. Okay, but watch out for weed seed, and we'll talk about that. Tea bags are fine if the bag itself is biodegradable. Okay, so you can look at most of them will be now. Okay, how many of you have seen the biodegradable plastics that we have now available to us in uh, in picnic uh, materials and things like the plates and forks and cups and things like that? Um, those really loud bags they had for a while from Sun Chips, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things. They're all made with cornstarch, essentially plant starches, and uh, they will decompose in your. Uh, but watch out, make sure that they are. Don't introduce plastics or other things which break down, you know, eons from now. People ask me all the time about eggshells. Can I add eggshells? Well, you can. Eggshells are mineral, though they're not organic materials. Um, they're basically lime or cal calcium carbonate materials. Okay, We have lots of lime in our soils. We don't really need any more, but you can break them up and throw them in, and they help to kind of open and aerate the pile anyway. They're kind of a mineral addition to your compost, and that's okay. It won't hurt anything, but realize that they probably won't break down. You'll probably see them in those little pieces for a long time until they dissolve. Uh, away, because that's what has to happen to them for them to disappear. They'll break down in smaller and smaller and smaller pieces physically, but they don't decompose like the organic materials do. Okay? So we've already talked about don't add the meat, meat byproducts, the animal fatty kinds of things like dairy and stuff, or manures from meat eaters, and no plastics and metals and other things which won't decompose in my lifetime or yours. You know, it, it won't, it, it'll smell a little bit, but you can improve that. Don't worry about if it gets in there. It'll decompose over time. No, unless, you know, there's some things in there that pathogenically we want to make sure that we get the pile up to temperature to help us maybe sterilize a little out, out of the system. We'll talk about that here too in a second. Although it's kind of fun to haze cats from your compost pile with a, with a paintball gun. <laughs> All right. I don't have any cats, so I can say that. The neighbors come in there, and they're like, okay. <laughs> All right, the recipe. Okay. And again, this is an art. We got some basic science to it. We want, we want to make sure that we have equal parts, right, to provide the nutrient base. But you're going to find that you're going to get out there, and you're going to think you've mixed it in the well, and then you're going to get the clumping that you talked about a minute ago, or it's going to seem too smelly, or something else you realize, well, maybe it's too wet, or have an imbalance in there, and i got to improve that. So we want to add equal parts, and I'm not going to tell you go out and buy a big scale or something and measure these. You're just roughing this up, okay? You, you, you're going to look at this and say, okay, I'm going to add equal parts of brown and green materials to the pile, and I'm going to layer or mix them. Some people don't want to really spend the time to mix them really thoroughly together, but you can layer them. In fact, how many of you have seen these, like, lasagna gardening things, okay? That's layered composting. That's all it really is. So you're layering different things, and uh, their little recipe for making that lasagna garden is exactly what we're talking about here. 
green and brown materials, green and brown materials that are mixed in that layering thing so that you have active composting going on while you're actually growing in the medium at the same time. Okay, so that's the whole idea behind that lasagna gardening kind of thing. Add water to this, to the consistency of a wrung out sponge. That's quite a bit of water in the material. I don't worry about this because my compost heap is kind of in the middle of my, uh, in the corner of my yard where it gets irrigation water anyway. And so I typically get enough water just from irrigation that gets the pile wet. But if you're in a drier spot, make sure that you wet it up periodically because, you know, this thing, this pile is heating up. And as it heats up, it literally drives the water that's in the pile away. It dries the pile out. The process of composting itself dries the pile. So we want to make sure we're adding it to continually so that we keep it moist. Why? Because the microbes, they don't like being dry. They want water, okay? And they need water to uh, not only grow like they should, but even the movement of them within the pile and and uh, the transfer of materials between them and things like that oftentimes is facilitated by water films and other things. So we want plenty of water in the system for them to function the way that they should. Then we want to keep the pile well aerated. Remember we said that it's driving off a lot of heat, it's driving off a lot of water, it's also driving off carbon dioxide. And as it does that, it's consuming the oxygen in the pile in that oxidative process to burn that material down over time. And very quickly, the oxygen within that pile will be all used up. When that happens, it has to start using other ions or other elements to facilitate that breakdown process. And that's where we start getting other gases that come off that we don't want to deal with. So if the pile goes anaerobic, It'll start using other things like sulfur and other things, okay, to do that with. And so we'll get things like hydrogen sulfide gas, rotten egg gas, okay, methane production, which is all right, except that that's a greenhouse gas, number one, and it's kind of smelly, number two. And so we want to watch out for that. Um, so we want to keep it well aerated. So in the middle of the warm season, once temperatures get up about to 50 degrees Fahrenheit or better, and that compost pile is able to actively process the material, we want to turn it one or two weeks in interval, okay? So every week or two, I want to make sure I'm turning that pile, I'm remixing the materials, I have an opportunity to re-wet the pile, and I'm incorporating a lot more oxygen into the internal parts of that that'll allow the process to continue rapidly to break the material down. Okay, so if it goes anaerobic, it's gonna be smelly, and it's gonna slow way down in terms of its decomposition. So if you're burning once a week, how long are you gonna stay fast, or how long will it take to get there? Yeah, if I'm not turning it at all, it might be five or six, seven months, okay, before it really decomposes. But in the active period, if I'm turning it once a week or once every two weeks, I can process it in about three months, okay? So you're cutting it down maybe a third of the length of time it'll take to get things decomposed in there. I start as soon as the temperature gets up high enough in the spring that I can really do some active composting, and that's probably not generally around here until late April, okay? Once we get into that time period where things are up above about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, I can actively be turning things. I can take what was left in there from the fall that's been kind of sitting there over winter with not much attention and get it ready to go into the garden by the end of May because it's had some time to sit and kind of molder over the winter anyway and I just really speed it up by turning the pile frequently that early spring and it's ready to introduce in the garden by Memorial Day you know when everybody says you should be doing gardens in Logan <laughs> not before right because they say it's gonna freeze but you can do other things before that, but uh, some of the old timers will tell you don't don't do things till late May around here. But that's the kind of time frames we're looking at on some of these. So, how do we cite them? Where are we going to put them? Um, make sure that you're taking into consideration the odor concerns. I like the smell of well-managed 
compost piles, but a lot of people don't, my wife included. Okay, sunny location. Uh, around here, we can't really take advantage of winter composting. It's just too darn cold. Um, so I don't do anything with my pile after about Thanksgiving. It just sits until April. Because you really can't actively compost with as cold as it is. It just won't really process very well. Plus, I really don't want to trudge through a foot and a half or two of snow to get to it. How, okay. do you have, how, do, how did you um, construct your pile? Is it in a bin or is it just loose? Great questions. You know, these are great segues to two or three slides down the line. Okay. So <laughs> we'll, we'll be all right with that. We'll hang on to that until we get to that point. Uh, but we do want to increase, I mean, we, we, it's cold enough here in the evenings that it'd be nice to be in a sunny location that builds up heat in the pile. And so if it's in a sunny spot, you'll be better off. Close to a water source so that I can put that water in it as I turn it. Incidentally, it's really tough. <clears throat> if you're starting off with a compost pile, don't put the whole pile together and then try to wet it. Drier organic materials tend to take water very poorly, <laughs> and so it'll shed the water off. And you'll put a lot of water on that pile and realize it's only penetrated a couple of inches into the pile. So wet it up as you go when you're first constructing these and make sure that they're wetted as you turn them. And you want them in a fairly constant location. You don't want to necessarily be moving them all over the place. And this gets to your slide or your question about containment and the designs and things like that. So we've got the recipe, we've got a couple of pointers on the kinds of things that we're going to watch out for with the different materials that we introduce, them, uh, introduce to the pile. Now what about constructing the pile? How big does it have to be and those kinds of things? To really build up the heat that needs to happen within the pile, you need a fairly large mass to start with. Now you can do it in small containers with less mass and still accomplish active composting. How many of you seen, you know, little uh, household compost containers that you can just, you know, take the scraps from, uh, you know, plants, your fruits and vegetables and things like that, and just actively compost right there in the, in the house. Vermicompost containers, you know, with the worms and things like that are smaller than I'm suggesting here. But that's because they're confined and they're contained and the heat can be built up and stored within those smaller volumes just fine. But if you're outside, and it's you know exposed to the air temperature and everything else. You need about a three by three by three foot pile so that it builds up the heat within the pile high enough to accomplish a couple of things. I can't be watching for every cat. The question came back here. You know that's going to visit my pile. I can't uh, know exactly what weed seeds have been introduced to the pile over time, um, those kinds of things. So if I can get that temperature up to about 140 or so degrees Fahrenheit within the pile, I can denature those seeds, I can uh, sterilize the pile, and I can get rid of most of the pathogenic organisms and weed seed in the pile over time, and that's really what I'm interested in doing with heating it up, okay? It's also the most rapid at that temperature to decompose in the first place. So you'll see a lot of people go to real Cadillac designs. Well, they'll have a fresh material bin. It'll do some early moldering there. Then they'll move it into a cell to kind of sit for a little bit longer. And they'll have some place where they're continually introducing new materials here uh, as that's rotated out. And then eventually that gets you know all uh, broken down. And then they can store it in some other bin that they'll use then to pull out of for uses in their pots or their garden or their flower beds or what have you, okay? That's really Cadillac. My neighbor behind me, that's the kind of system, the bin system that they have, three different sections. And they're each three by three by three? Yeah, they're about that size, each one of them. So that's about, you know, it's about a 10 foot long thing. It's three or four feet in, in width and height. <clears throat> to me, that's overkill. You can accomplish it with much smaller uh, or more simple approaches. And everything from as simple as going and getting just some construction fabric, quarter inch uh, metal mesh that comes in rolls generally. And so you get a, 
a, a section that's maybe 10 feet or so long. When I bring that back around on itself, I have about a three foot circle cylinder, okay? I can use cable ties to secure it in that cylinder shape. And uh, I can dump all my materials into it and it's open, a lot of oxygen and gas exchange in and out of the pile. When I'm ready to turn it, all I need to do is clip those cable ties, open that screen, set it down next to the pile, re-zip it with a couple of cable ties, and pitchfork my material into that new location. So you can just alternate locations. Here it is, you know, one week. The next week I move it to the site next door to it, put all the stuff in, re-wet it, mix it in, move it back two weeks later to the other location where it was before. And I just keep moving it back and forth like that. The same thing you can do here with more of a fancier frame. I use this design. I've got um, a wood frame with chicken wire uh, covering, but it's open on the bottom and I'm able to uh, just lift that off the pile and set it down next to the, to the pile and pitchfork the stuff over. So I'm turning the pile as I go along and I re-wet it as I do that along the way if I need extra water. Yeah? Well, you said open on the bottom. Is that critical? Uh, no. Uh, the, the only thing I like about that <laughs> is that when you got all those really good, juicy, goopy materials down there in contact with the soil, all the worms in the world <laughs> are going to find their way into my pile. And the lower foot of my compost pile moves. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I, I take my compost pile off, and that's one of the reasons my wife doesn't like it. When, when, I, when I scoop that stuff back in, I've got all that stuff that's down there on the bottom, and the worms have just populated it like crazy. Um, that really helps in the processing of the material, and I reintroduce all that, worms and all, worm cysts and everything else into my garden, and that helps to promote their flourishing there as well. Yeah. I just add it continually. Oh. If I have bu a bunch of stuff, I try to add it in brown and green proportions to the top of the pile. And then the next time I turn it, it all gets mixed in with the, with the rest of what's there. If it's like this too, and I'm using a pitchfork to, to do this turning, I can't pick up the real small things with a pitchfork, okay? I can do that with my hands or a rake or something else. <clears throat> but the fact that I'm pitchforking it over then the stuff that's really broken down well and is decomposed tends to fall to the bottom. And by the time I'm done turning the pile, I have this mound of stuff that's pretty well decomposed and processed. I can actually pull that aside. I stick it in my wheelbarrow. It's ready to go. Stuff that ends up being at the bottom of the pile, essentially. And then all the new material is kind of just reintroduced into it as I've gone along. So I just, I'm, I'm continually adding to the top of my pile, and when I turn it is when I really worry about it getting mixed in thoroughly with the rest of the stuff that's there. And like I said, then you end up with fairly well cured stuff at the bottom that I can use right now. Now, my wife does like the end product, okay? <laughs> Just give me the stuff I can use. Don't make me be part of the process. But uh, we like to use it in our, our potted plants. You know, we're, we, you get a lot of... Uh, Salt buildup, for instance, in your household house plants and things, just because we got kind of water, minerals in our water anyway. So we're replacing out and repotting and, and making it a nice environment for the plant to continue to thrive. And we'll use this material as our potting mix a lot of times because it's just a really nice material to use that way. So she likes to use it there and in, in around the flower beds. Yeah, Another two questions. Thing you can use a, on the, like the square one is the wooden pallets. Yeah, yeah, to, to form the frame. Yeah, old wooden pallets and things like that. Yep, yeah. Up until about, well, my youngest daughter moved out uh, this summer. She's a sophomore at, at uh, university. When I had the boys around, I had three boys before that that have all gone off to various things. I had just big handles on this thing, and I'd get two of them out there with me, and we'd lift it literally off the pile. Now it takes some doing. <laughs> I gotta, you know, kind of rock it and lean it and roll it over, kind of thing, and then I can move it myself. But uh, there's a design here. You'll see that they—you can't really see it very well, 
but they've got a hook and eye system on one of the corners of it here and some hinges on the other side or other additional hook and eyes and they can just delatch the walls essentially and open it up like you did with you know cutting the zip ties here that would help a lot i think i need to redesign mine now that i've lost my slave labor <laughs> out there you said all the good stuff's at the bottom that's where your worms and everything are too yeah because they get up and they start you, you know populating the pile if I don't need it at the moment, I'll just mix, mix it back in. But for the most part, I like to pull it aside, stick it in my wheelbarrow or in a pile somewhere in the garden and use that material when it's ready to go. Yeah. Worms and all. Yeah. Because it, it gets repopulated. The worms are there, believe me. Okay. <laughs> we don't have to do much. If we, if we create the conditions that the earthworms like, They'll be there. It's, it's literally an if you build it, they will come arrangement, okay, with earthworms. Um, earthworm cysts uh, that, you know, that the encapsulated, you know, uh, reproductive uh, cells of these earthworms can stay latent in soils for 50, 60, 70 years before the conditions are right for them to hatch and flourish. And uh, they, they withstand really dry conditions for a time sometimes, and they'll last for for decades before they'll, you know, hey, feels good, I get going. And then they start going and proliferate. And uh, so literally, if you create the conditions that are conducive to earthworm growth in our system, where we have a lot of them there anyway, naturally, they come in with the irrigation water, they come in with the plants you bring in that are potted already. Uh, there's cysts in those potting mixes. Uh, there's all kinds of things. We've incorporated a lot of earthworm initiates in our soil and they'll they'll thrive and go but I can promote them definitely so this is kind of the basic construction you can get away with a single unit now there's a really cool one at Sam's Club right now I don't know if you've all seen it uh, right in the middle there you know they have all the yard things you can buy and whatnot they've got these compost bins that uh, are on a on an axle system they're elevated it's a big bin you can throw the stuff in, it's well aerated, and when you're ready to turn it, just roll the thing like a big lottery ball spinner <laughs> thing or something. And it just kind of rolls the material inside. You can accomplish the same with an old 55-gallon drum. Uh, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. It makes it easier a little bit for people that, you know, I turned 50 this summer, okay? I have my AARP card. It's getting harder and harder for me to take that giant, that's a four by four by four foot wood frame thing off of the pile, okay? So make it so that you can uh, manage it yourself. Yes? In the winter time, do you leave it open or do you cover it? I leave it open. It's going to receive water and snow and everything else. In fact, it's kind of cool because when my kids were younger, you know, the, the science guy in me wanted to take them out and do the Mr. Wizard thing, you know, with them. So we'd go out there in the middle of the winter, and there'd be a foot and a half of snow on the compost pile. We'd brush it off and open the pile, and they'd reach in, and it's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit down in there. Still, you know, it's just cooking real slow in the pile. And the steam's coming off the pile and everything else. And They humored me two or three times, and then it was, okay, we've been there, we've done that, and, you know, okay, you don't have to do that anymore. Now, you can't really see this, but there's all kinds of other designs, you know, some people make a trench and they throw everything in the trench and they cover it with a little bit of soil and they just let natural processes take their time, let it break down over time. They'll throw it in a big pile and they'll just leave it there, okay? Brought a student with me that works in our soil uh, testing laboratory, Emily back there in the back. She, uh, she said her aunt, you know, a real hippie, she had a compost pile. She just basically threw stuff out the window, you know, <laughs> in a pile. She eventually got rid of it because it smelled so bad right next to the window. But you can do anything you want, okay? This guy has an old bathtub, and he's actively composting around it in a big pile. It's kind of leaning against the bathtub. And when he gets kind of some finished material, he's putting it in the bathtub, and he's got a little hoop house that he's growing his vegetable starts in, okay? <laughs> so he'll take the vegetable starts and all the compost that's been stored in there. When it's time to do the garden, he's ready to go, okay? It is ugly as snot, but very effective, okay? <laughs> You've got, like I said, commercial containers. You can order through nurseries. Sam's Club has that one. It's on a, a spinning axle kind of thing, little hatch doors on it. 
Um, it just looks like some old uh, garden fencing that they've put in a square and they're piling things in on top of it. So you can do it all kinds of different ways as long as you do it. You got a good recipe, good moisture, good sight, and regular turning. You can keep it from smelling bad, okay? And it's really exciting to see the development of something useful that uh, you can incorporate into the soil for all kinds of really good benefits. We'll talk about the benefits here in a second. Yeah. Uh, I'd just trap it. Yeah. I mean, are they, are they going to be attracted? Is it going to get too hot for them? No. No, that's going to be, they, they'll, they'll just kind of, you know, they won't go right into the heart of it. They'll stay away from the hottest part. So they, they like the warmth. They'll, you might want to watch out for putting stuff in it that they're really interested in eating, like whole grain. You know, I mean, if you have waste corn or anything like that, or things that are going to attract them to the pile. I try to do whatever you can to prevent them from colonizing the pile by trapping them and getting rid of them that way. But, you know, they're, they're going to be attracted. They'll be less attracted if there aren't the things that they want to eat there. Okay. When is it done? When it doesn't smell bad. Okay. It's got that rich, earthy smell that soil scientists, you know, are born loving then it's probably ready to go. If it doesn't resemble the initial materials that you put, if you can't tell it, if, if you can't tell that it's last year's tomato vine or this year's unwanted zucchini plant or whatever it might be, uh, then it's probably broken down enough. When it doesn't heat, if you've got enough moisture in it and you've got a good mix of brown and green materials and I turn the pile and I don't see it coming up to temperature, um, how do I know? I've gone to Walmart and I bought just a little digital thermometer. It cost me 10 bucks. Okay. So I turn it and I let it sit for a day. I'll go back out. I'll open it up. I'll stick that thermometer down in the heart of the pile. If I don't get it up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit pretty quickly, then I know I've done most of the rapid decomposition in the pile. And either I need to reintroduce new materials or I'll just take that material and incorporate it into the soil. There's also an expediency factor. It's ready to use when I'm ready to use it, right? But remember the problem that we could have if we introduce materials that aren't completely cured, that haven't had that ratio between the carbon and nitrogen narrowed enough. I could put it into the soil and I could cause that immobilization uh, of nutrient that I don't want to have happen. So if you end up doing this, if you say, well, I just, It'd be best if I could get it out of the pile and into the, I got so much other stuff or whatever, and use it, then incorporate a little bit of nitrogen. Now, you may be against that from a paradigm of, say, organic or sustainable kinds of approaches, and you don't want to add mineral fertilizer, that's fine. Let it continue to cure before you use it. But if you want to use it before it's fully cured, add some extra mineral nitrogen in the material as you incorporate it in the soil. And the rule of thumb is... A pound of nitrogen per 100 pounds of material, if you're going to do that. That'll give you enough nitrogen to continue to break the material or provide for the breakdown of the material without arresting the available nitrogen from the soil pool. Yeah? When you add minerals, they can, they, they can hear about that all the time. So if you use a lot of compost, you're locking up all your nutrients to use by the time you need it, you don't have these. Yeah, it's a lot slower release mechanism than the mineral fertilizer. The other advantage is that I get organic materials, <laughs> okay, from that that I don't get from mineral fertilizers. My perspective is, is that there's a place for both if they're managed properly, but you cannot rectify a lack of organic matter in soils with continued increases in mineral nutrient input, okay? I can't, because what's gonna happen is over time, organic matter itself is gonna continue to break down. This stuff I'm putting in this compost isn't gonna stay there for very long. It's gonna be chewed on and broken down and so forth. I'm gonna lose the benefit to soil structure and aggregation and you know uh, just the general health of the habitat there uh, in the soil over time. 
as it continues to break down. If I'm not replenishing that as a resource to my soil, my soil quality is going to steadily decline. And I can't overcome a lack of structure and aggregation and organic matter content, things like that, with increases in mineral nutrients. You say over time you're talking a lot of years. Not very many. It doesn't take many years. Um, it takes me about four to five years in our environment to get to that optimal creation of aggregation in a soil. So say you put in a new turf or something like that, you won't really see the real nice, natural, aggregated, well-performing soil system in our, in our neck of the woods for about four or five years. I can almost obliterate that in two months, okay? Because the soil doesn't have enough organic matter in it to supply the hungry microbes that are there naturally. They'll break it down pretty fast. Well, if you you got a quite a bit of volume and it, it's separated from the mass, you don't have as many of those microbes that are dealing on it if it's incorpororated in with the soil matrix. Yeah, I, I okay. In, so okay. I so yeah, no, it, it, you'll you'll see a benefit over a long period of time, but the real replenishment you're needing to do on an annual basis with this stuff. So we'll get into that here. Here, how many? What about amending our soils with this material? When you say one pound of nitrogen, you're saying actual nitrogen? Actual nitrogen. So if you're using, say, ammonium sulfate, you, you need five pounds of ammonium sulfate to get one pound of nitrogen, yeah, because it's only 20% nitrogen. Yeah. yeah, good point. You need, that's pounds of the actual nutrient. So the benefits from this organic input is not only the nutrient that comes from it, but the effects of these gelatinous, sticky, gooey materials that are created on the breakdown of the material, of the organic material, that provide the bridges that hold together the soil particles in aggregates and things like that, and also provide surface area for the absorption of water and other nutrients and things like that to be held or retained in the soil. It helps reduce compaction, provides nutrients themselves as they break down, and so we get this aggregation. Now, if you take a look at, you can't really see this very well, but these are individual soil particles. The small ones clays, the medium ones silts, the big ones sands. There's pores in between them, spaces in between them. But as I incorporate organic materials that hold those little individual mineral particles together, I create new pores that are larger still than the ones in between the individual soil particles call them macropores, the spaces in between the aggregates that form. And so I'm going to get benefits in really clay soils from organic matter additions in terms of opening the system up. I'm also going to get benefit in really sandy soils with the application of organic materials because now I have more surface area for the absorption of water that I didn't have before. So you're going to get benefits in both soil textural extremes from the organic materials over time. And you've seen well structured, you can't see this very well, but that granular structure that begins to develop under perennial planting that's undisturbed, you get those nice aggregates. They're not clods. I can take a big brick of clay and I can whack it with a hammer when it's dry and I break off little pieces. Those are clods, okay? There's no real structure to them. They just are bound together, cemented together. These are diagnostic soil development modules, I'll call them, or PEDs, okay? That's a real scientific thing right there. They're called PEDs, not clods. They're actually diagnostic of soil development. You'll see them forming naturally on their own, where you look at them under a microscope and you'll see the coatings of organic materials that bridge those uh, mineral things together. We only have about a minute here, but we have very low organic matter contents in our soils naturally. We're never satisfied with that. The more the better, really, when it comes to organic matter. Um, I'm not satisfied. You have to add it annually to replace the benefits from it. And if you're talking about on perennial plantings like a lawn, turf area, a quarter to a half an inch, it's added each year. It doesn't matter if it's the spring or fall. You want to add it when there's enough moisture for it to begin to break down and 
get into the system. In an annual planting area like your garden, at least an inch of material on the surface incorporated because that's just replenishment levels of organic material. That's going to burn up over the course of a year. It'd be nice if I could add more and people say, well, how much more? I say, as much as you can handle. It's really hard to incorporate a foot of material with, you know, spading or rototilling or what have you. But, you know, two to three inches is fairly easily managed, and you can just add as much as you have available to you. Um, one of the things you need to watch out with is make sure that it's low salt material. Home compost generally, generally is really good. But if you bring in compost from another source, like the landfill and other places, they mix other things into it. They also have dusts and things that carry a lot of salts, leftover uh, uh, irrigation water deposits and things on materials that get incorporated into the pile, which are also salts. So if, if that happens, make sure you put a little extra water to push those salts through the system. Yeah, yeah, it's been leached a lot better. They've been, you know, they're 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 worried about watching for those salts on those really high managed eco. What did you call it? Eco, eco, eco. Yeah, those are that's a new company that's taking a lot of uh, produce waste from from uh, large markets, you know, grocery stores and other things, and they're processing it. It's pretty low salt material. The compost out of the landfill tends to be a little high. Um, but you can resolve that by putting just a little extra irrigation water on and pushing that salt you through. No, no, that's all dissolved salts. All dissolved. Yeah, yeah. Which are fertilizers? I mean, no, not always. They're just mineral content that's left behind or evaporites. You know, for the most part in our our area. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can put it on every year. If you guys want to refer back to your uh, notes, we got started a little bit late because of technical difficulties, but uh, the notes will show you a couple of things to watch out for on incorporating mechanically. Uh, you can make matters worse by using mechanical means of opening the soil up because you're adding you know, energy to the system with that machine. And so if it's too wet or too dry, then you're going to cause problems, uh, or more, it could cause more problems than you're resolving. So watch out for that. It's still a great way to incorporate these organic materials. But if you see big clumps coming up, it's typically then too wet. If it's just bouncing on the surface and not biting well, all the way to the depth of the tines, it's probably too dry. And in both cases, you can, you can put too much energy into the system and cause compaction. Doesn't matter as long as the conditions are not too dry or too wet in either one of those. Yep. Yeah, one of the problems you got to watch out for there is, though, they're putting a solid poker of some sort into the soil. And so, like with, a, with an aerator, make sure you're using an open tine aerator and not a solid tine aerator. Because what is a solid tine aerator doing? It's a nail, essentially. It's compacting the area right around the aerator itself. So make sure you're using a hollow tine aerator that's pulling a core out. It's compacting a little bit right at the very base where the cutting edge is, but not nearly as much as a solid tine aerator will. So th even those things that are forks that are going into the ground and kind of pulling things apart still cause some compaction right around the tine itself. So, you know, to me, the, the open tine aerators are the best ones, the cylinder types. And you can tell if it's too wet or too dry with these, because if it's too wet, you'll get ruts forming because these are fairly heavy under the wheels. If it's too dry, you won't be getting a full-length core out of it. And then it's just lifting the machine up on the cutting edge as it's going through. It's not pushing all the way down uh, so that the weight's borne by the tires. And you're putting huge amounts of pressure on that small surface area of the cutter, and that's causing compaction more than it's relieving. So uh, this is a great way in a turf to open up the system so that you can get the organic application in put on the half inch of compost, rake it down in so it gets down in the holes that are left behind. It's a great way to do it as long as you're making sure it's not too wet or too dry and causing things. We've already talked about woody and green materials. So with that, I'm five minutes over and eating into your lunchtime.